Seeking your face, touching. 
to see our children who seem like they're off in the far distance. They may be out doing their thing, kind of disregarding the way we have guided them and led them to know Jesus. But God is promising he's sending them home. They're coming back. So have that as your expectation that maybe right now you don't see them. They seem wayward. They're off, doing their things, walking away from the way that you trained them or guided them or led them. But God said, be at peace. He never takes his eyes off of them. He is with them. You have to know he's with them. He's speaking to them too. He was saying, no, 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 no. Just like I'm doing with Sophia. I'm like, no, no, no. Yeah, are you into this? No, 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 no. Yeah, he's, he's guiding. They may be trying to blow him off, but he is tougher, stronger, more relentless, more powerful, more loving. He will never let go. He will never let go of them. So we have to trust, even in these situations where we are concerned, Many of us have reason for concern, but God is sending them home. The prodigals are coming back home. He keeps reminding me of that. 
He keeps reminding me. When I look over here, how long has it been since we've seen DeAndre or Corey and Santana moving closer to this area? He's showing signs of growth in what he wants to do with our young ones here. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for those who come and practice and support this youth, this new generation. I'm excited that you want to step out, Lauren, and do what could be intimidating, or like Corey doing what could have been intimidating in our worship team each and every Sunday. So I'm grateful for that. I just want you to, I want you to feel the sense of hope that you get when you give thanks. When you give thanks, God can take care of this. He says, stop worrying about the children. He keeps saying that over and over. Stop worrying about them. I'm trying to fix things here, fix things there. He says, stop worrying about them. They're my children first. They belong to me. They're on loan to you, but they're mine. So, Father, we thank you for that. Give us that assurance and that peace, that deep, deep assurance that you do exceed and abundantly above all that we could ask or think. That's what we're thankful for. We're thankful, Father. We're thankful in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. It's up to bed. Be quick. I'll be quick, I promise. Hi, everybody. All right. So, real quick, um, I had a really crazy incident that happened at work last weekend. There was a lady, I was eating lunch, and there was this lady, I mean, um, one of my coworkers, he, like, busts in the break room. He's like, how do, how do you page out? He's, like, real frantic. I'm like, pound zero, zero. And I hear code blue. I'm like, what happened? And so he's like, a lady passed out in the bathroom. So, like, my first instinct is to go in there and... It, it was far more than I could do. We needed Kristen. I I didn't know what to do. <laughs> I mean, the lady, like, seriously, she had a heart attack while she was urinating. And um, she was an older lady, and she was laid out on the floor. And I'm just looking, and I've never seen nothing like this in my life. I mean, she was blue, everything. It was mm -mm, not for me. So the daughter was in there. <laughs> she, she was real frantic. This is my expert. This is where I can, you know, I can do my thing. So I'm like, ma'am, and I'm, you know, she's like hyperventilating. So I pull her out, and she's like, I can't do this. And I mean, understandably, that's her mom. And, you know, she's not breathing. She's not responding. And then luckily, two nurses who were in the building heard the code blue. So they came in, and um, they started performing CPR. And she, by this time, she had already been without oxygen for like five minutes. By the time the, ped the paramedics got there, it was almost 10 minutes. And when the nurses were doing CPR, she wasn't responding. So they had to do the defibrillator and um, all types of stuff. So I, I brought the daughter out. I mean, she's like hysterical. I'm like, ma'am, you have got to calm down. Like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to calm her down. And I just asked her, I was like, are you religious? And she was like, yes. I was like, do you want to pray? And at this moment, I don't even know what I'm praying for. I don't, I just was like, Lord, guide me, because this is, I don't know what to say. Like, and so I'm just, you know, I'm praying with her. And then, long story short, we get to, we're helping the medics bring the, the, um, the, the gurney out. Yes, thank you. And I see the white sheet. I'm like, oh, my gosh, she died. Like, I was, I was all scared, you know. Then I started having a panic attack because I seen her. I seen the sheet, and I'm like, Lord, no, this, this is not for me. Like, I can't handle. Like, I can't do it. So long after that, so I realized it was just, like, the privacy sheet. And she was, she was all right. She was stable. So the whole time I'm, I, I'm praying, and I, I mainly, like, lost it because I'm like, I told her it was going to be okay. And that's one of the first things you learn at, being a, like a, a therapist, you never tell anybody that it's going to be okay because you never know. So I was like, oh, my gosh. But just in the moment, I got so wrapped up. I'm like, it'll be okay. And so I just felt bad for her. My heart hurt for her. So I was praying, and I'm like, Lord, just give me a sign that she lived. I just want to know because she had been without oxygen for a very long time. So um, a couple days later, her friend came in and just gave us an update and said, she was doing well, and she was talking now. She's out of the coma and everything. So 
that was that was good to hear. So this is we're talking about a generation here. We're talking about a generation here, right, David? And how critical it is for us to have the right foundation. Because even in situations, maybe the calmest people may have been disturbed. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit led you to do what you did. And I believe we're going to have more and more testimonies. That's why the young ones are under attack. The power in them is so great. But remember, they belong to him first. That's why he spoke to Joshua and Caleb. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. You've got to be strong, but not in your own power, but in the power of his might. All right, Dawn, I have to give it to David, but you, you can contend with him. Dawn, come on up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Dawn in the flesh. But you're, I just wanted to piggyback on what you said because I remember a time at home, of course, for some of you who don't know, I'm the one that moved to Atlanta. But I went out to work, and my neighbor was like, you know, I'm going to help you. You're a single mother, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, that's cool. I thought that, you know, she was having sent. So my children started going to her house just for the weekend because I work weekends only. Well, I noticed more and more problems with my children, especially the boy. So I just prayed about it and prayed about it. I knew I needed a job. But at the same time, my kids were more important. So I continued to pray. I stepped out on faith, and I walked away from a job because my son needed me more. So I just, from being here, I just remember always being told, you know, that number one, you have to pray. Number two, I have to believe I have to have faith. And I'm like, well, I've been down here struggling. <laughs> you know I'm struggling. <laughs> if I need to walk away from this job, it's because you have something better. Walked away, well, I applied for a couple jobs before I left. I wound up coming back home. So I worked from home again, walked away from a job, and was able to get these kids situated. But it was definitely a process for me because I was scared. And I was roughing it for a little bit. But I was scared. And then I remembered that, you know, he's carried me and these kids this far, being down there by myself with just them. So I know he knows the needs, and he's going to meet the needs. And he did. We're, we're great. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> wow. I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. We're going to receive the offering now. Thank you.
Thank you, Jesus. Y'all come on in. Hallelujah. Praise God. Come on, have a seat. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father. Well, good morning. Amen. It got real quiet real quick. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let the leaves blow in. Amen. <laughs> well, praise God. It's good to be here. Good to see you. Boy, what a wonderful high praise today. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate that, uh, guys and gals. We really appreciate you uh, really responding to what God was telling you to sing and play. Amen. 
and that we moved in, in that direction spirit. Thank you so much. Really uh, appreciate that. One thing we're going to be talking about today before we get started, I'm going to start around, and it's not, and I'll, I will go to wisdom and faith uh, uh, today, uh, and we'll, we will move forward in that area, but I do want to go over here, and it's, it's not necessarily in the PowerPoint, but it is in Matthew 5, it's in Matthew chapter 5, and it starts around verse 11. I want to talk a little bit about that, about being the salt and the light of the earth. Uh, because so many things were said today that, uh, that really were uh, foundational to uh, living out uh, our lives in a personal way and also in how we exhibit our faith to others. And I'd like to welcome those who are watching today. I know Cindy is watching and Pam and Tammy and Steve and uh, of course Dawn is here and uh, there are a few other people that may be watching so we welcome you here to and we hope that what you've seen so far has been uh, contributing to your heart. Uh, you know, God is doing, I think, a new thing today. He's not, God is not interested in personalities. He's not interested in us in following personalities. And we know that Paul had that issue with the Corinthians. Uh, if you look at around Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians around chapter 1 and 2, we know that the Corinthians were very divided, and they were following Cephas, and they were following Apollos. And Paul says, y'all got to stop this. He said, you know, what? it's not up to us to follow personality. The one we should be following is Jesus. And he sort of admonished them for that because they got off on the wrong track. And I would say that God is doing a new thing today. He's not interested in personalities, but he's interested in the hearts of people. And, and so sometimes I think we mistakenly build our churches on the personalities of people, or the personalities of his leaders. And really, we should be building our churches on the personality of Jesus, the character of Jesus, and his word. And I think God will be doing a new thing as the days move forward, as the day comes upon us, that he's not interested in people in, in people following people, but people following him in all his ways. But how do people follow us? How are people inspired to follow us? And it does, and it does go back here to, verse, uh, to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to start with verse 11, and then I'll move into to verse 13 and so forth. It says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. So said, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. You know, our reward is in heaven. Our reward is not necessarily here on earth. Let me say that again, because sometimes we're looking for it. It's great if we can get blessed here on earth. It's great, and that's, that's wonderful. But my reward is heaven. My, my ultimate home is heaven. And so somebody mentioned that, you know, uh, that, that Abby and his daughter, Abby knows where her, her daughter is, in heaven. And that's the greatest reward that we could ever have, is to be at home with our Lord and Savior, the one who created us, the one who brought our lives together, the one who sustains us. That could be the greatest gift that man could ever have. And I think sometimes we fall short in saying that, well, I want to eat, we want to, you know what? The Word says, you know, be careful where your treasures are. And that we don't lay up treasures upon this earth, but we lay up treasures for heaven. And that's where our treasure is in heaven, it's being with him. So it goes on and says that, and this is Jesus speaking to us. This is, not, this is not Paul, this is not Peter, this is not John, this is not Daniel, but this is Jesus saying this to us. It says, now, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? How, if we lose our flavoring, if we lose our praise, if we lose our prayer, if we lose our ability to the season, if we lose our ability to carry this light of Christ in us, if we lose our ability to stop the corruption because salt has all kinds of good properties, and that's why he references salt and light, because salt has all kinds of good properties in terms of preserving in terms of uh, stopping corruption or infection, in terms of uh, flavoring. So salt has a number of, of qualities, this is, but if we lose those qualities, we can't influence the world. We can't even begin to walk in wisdom if we lose the flavor of what God has given to us. And this is Jesus. This is, he says, 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 so you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses, and of course that's the if, the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? You know, we talk about wisdom, we know that, that, 
that 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 the 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 young the older people are supposed to be that salt. They're supposed to be that seasoning that pass on the flavor, uh, the preserving, uh, the light to the younger generation. And so, how can we do that if we effectively have lost our flavor and if we effectively have lost our ability to carry His light with us? It's profound what Jesus is saying. And he goes on to further say that it is then good for nothing. He said we have no value in his kingdom if we cannot go out and influence the world for him. We, we have no value if we cannot sit down at the, 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 the dinner table this Thanksgiving and some of this light come out of you. Hello. Amen? Because we should be thanking him. It's not about the day, but it's about thanking him and what he brings to the table. He says, so then it is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. He says, then the value that we have or should have in Christ is of no value at all. So we should understand and remember that we have this treasure, but in this earthen vessel that brings out the excellency of God, not just in us, but to other people that are around us. But, and, we want to, and we want to, you know, and also salt makes you thirst, right? Makes you thirsty, so we ought to have a thirst for God, and that's that's the that's contra- that's the analogy, that's the comparison that Jesus is giving here. That we should have an internal thirst for God. I, it's not my job to make you thirsty for God. Hello, it's not my place to make you thirsty for God. I just lead you to the water, and guess what? Who has to drink? You have to drink. But we should have that natural thirst for God because we are His salt. And so we should, we should move people in the direction. We can't tell them to receive Jesus, but we certainly can present Jesus to them. We can't save anybody, but we should put them into a position of being saved. And that, that's, that's what we do as, as, as believers. So then as we are good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. 14, verse 14, you are the light of the world. That's huge. That's tremendous that we, he says, you are the light of this world, and we know what is in this world. And so we have a task in front of us, as Jesus said in in Matthew 28, that, you know, I'm giving you commission to go into all the world to preach this gospel, and when it's preached, I'll come again. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. He says, you cannot hide what Christ has given to you. And so if we cannot hide it, then we ought to begin to share it. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And so Jesus has not given us this treasure. Jesus has not given us this valuable ability of grace. He has not given us this, this valuability of mercy and the love of, of all the fruits of the Spirit to be hidden under a basket and to, to, to hold it to ourselves, to take the ball and go away. But to take this ball, that's this, this treasure that we have, and, and spread it wherever we happen to be. Because Jesus places this value in us. Jesus places this treasure in us for us to give to other people. And not just to consume it to ourselves. And folks, Jesus is saying this, that he, he places something in you for you to share. For you to share with other people. It says, so you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, this is going to put you up there so you can be noticed. Let me say that again. He puts you on a lampstand so you can be noticed. Stand up. So don't complain when you're in a bad situation because he put you there to be his light. That's why you're there. Sometimes we ask, well, why me? Why don't we ask, why not me? That's a thought. Sometimes we go, oh, why, Lord, why me? And why don't we ask, why not me? Because I'm prepared and I am equipped. God has equipped me, and God is faithful to what he's given to me. It says, now, let your light shine. Let, it says, now, let your light so shine before men, before men, that they may see your good works. So that means there's an action, Right? You can't work sitting on your butt. Well, you can, but this is this. Is, but you know, here we understand what he's talking about. That there, that we are made. We are his masterpiece to do good works. It says so. Let what I place in you 
become active in your life. Let the mercy and grace and love and all the fruits of the Spirit that I place in you become active in your life so that other men may see my glory, so that other men may see my salvation, so that other men may see my hope in you, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. We, you know what? It's not, you know what? I, 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 thank God that I'm alive and I'm in this world. But there's something more than just living. There's something I, that we all are to do for him. If we believe, and we believe in the value of what he's placed in us. God has placed a tremendous value in us. God has placed a tremendous investment in us. And he wants to see a return on his investment, right? He wants to just like our children. I want to see, my, I want to see a return on my investment. My, my, my mom wants to see a return on investment in me. All the heartache I gave her. Amen. <laughs> so our father wants to see a similar investment. And he invested the life of his son Jesus. He invested the life of his son Jesus to redeem us from our wretched condition. And study that word wretched and look that up and see what it means. It means we were utterly wretched in every way, in every way. We were mean, evil, spiteful, and you, you put anything under wretched. In a wretched condition, he sent his son to save us. And so he, the investment that he placed in his son to redeem us is more valuable than gold. We cannot express how much his redemption has done for us. And because of his great redemption, I want to talk about my father. I want to talk about Jesus because he's placed such a great hope in my life that I might be part of the hope of his glory to people. We are part of the hope of the world. And that's not being arrogant. That's what Jesus says, that you are the light of the world. Everywhere you go, you carry the message of hope with you. Every day you get up, you may not feel like it. You may not see it, but you carry that message in you. And we have to be willing to open ourselves up in spite of sometimes how we feel. Because sometimes we, get up, we don't feel like speaking or saying hello or saying anything to anybody. That's the very moment we ought to be kind to people. That's the very moment that we ought to speak his praises to people. And so I just wanted to share this with you because if we don't believe we are the salt and light of the earth, you know, everything that Jesus said has come to pass. Let me say that again. Everything that Jesus said in Scripture has come to pass. There's nothing that Jesus hasn't said that won't come to pass. So if Jesus says this about us, then this is true. And this is how we should be walking in. He wants us to be valuable for the kingdom of God. My life truly is not my own. All that I have, I owe to Jesus. And I need to humble myself in his sight that he might lift us up, that he might lift me up. And so we are truly his light. And I don't know if we really understand the impact of what is being said here. Let me see something else here before I, before I move forward. I know the Ravens play the ball. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, that's right. Amen. It says here, let me see. Uh, let's turn over here to Colossians, Colossians chapter 4, let's start at verse 1. And for all of you, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, uh, for all of you that are home, but if you don't, turn, open your Bible to that, Colossians uh, chapter 4, verse 1. And we talked a little bit about this earlier. Whatever we're going through, it says now, it says now what you have, it says now to continue... Continue earnestly in prayer. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant, being disciplined, having a focus in it with what? With thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Continue earnestly in what you're doing 
with thanksgiving, meanwhile praying also for us that God would open us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains. Of course, he was in prison at the time. That I may make it manifest as I ought to speak what is in him. Now walk in wisdom. It says, now walk in wisdom. We've been talking about wisdom. Toward those who, who are outside redeeming the past or taking advantage of the opportunity that might exist. So we have to take advantage of every opportunity that will come across. You can't tell me that you don't have an opportunity to be a witness for Christ some, at some point during the day, even if it's to your own heart. Did you hear what I said? Even if it's to your own heart. Even if it's to your if you. So we all have an opportunity at some point during the week, or hallelujah, during the day, during the week, to be a witness for him and taking an opportunity, and that's what it means here, taking the opportunity, redeeming the time, taking the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. There it is again. What's that word? Salt. There it is again, that preserver that we just read about, that salt, that wisdom, that salt that you may know how you ought to answer each other. That having this great season, having this great light, seasoned with salt, having this grace, that we take the opportunity, the opportunity to be his witness, to share his love, to share his grace, to share his hope. It's to your heart, to your children, Somebody along the course of the day, you have a good word for, a kind word for. But well, people are missing kindness today. Just be kind to somebody. That's the character of God, isn't it? Just being kind to people. You know, just being kind to people. You don't have to, you don't have to raise the sign that you're a Christian. They'll know you by your love. Right? The word says they will know you by your love. So you don't have to carry a lot of people like carry, I'm a Christian. You don't have to carry, they will know you by your love. And so it says here, let me read this again. It says, continue earnestly in prayer. Jesus prayed a lot. He was earnest. He was vigilant. But thanksgiving, meanwhile, praying also for us that God will open to us a door for the word to speak, for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Though great fear try to come upon you, Lauren, it was an opportunity for you to speak a kind word, to speak some encouragement, to speak some hope, because you never know when it might come around again. So we take advantage of those opportunities, as it says here, to redeem that time, to show that grace. And I want to share that with you to show you the wonderful things that God has placed at our feet every day if we just open our eyes and if we simply open our spiritual, our spiritual eyes and spiritual ears, God presents us with opportunities every day to say something for him, even if it's to your own heart. Even if it's to your own heart. So don't, don't, don't shrug off those things, well, God can't use me. Well, you just, you, I don't, that's a negative witness. That's a negative witness. God can use you. You're the salt and light. He put it in you. And it can come out of you if you let it come out. Be that salt shaker uh, this Thanksgiving. Be that salt shaker for as long as you're upon this earth. I want to share that with you just to give you some encouragement to show you that, you know what, we are to be useful for the kingdom of God. It's a choice. It really is a choice. It's a choice. Okay, let's go over here now to, go back to the PowerPoint over here to 1 Corinthians 1.24. Back to wisdom and faith. And this is a part of the wisdom of God. And we may talk about that if we get to that today, about the scribes and Pharisees who rejected the wisdom of God. But not only did they reject the wisdom of God, they caused other people to be in a place where they could not experience the love of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God. But we may talk about that today if we get to it. But, but just briefly here, 1 Corinthians 1.24, in the Living Translation here, it says here, but to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. We know that because we've talked about that here already. So wisdom is found in the relationship with Christ since we are partakers of the divine nature. When we stay separated from him, we cannot walk in the wisdom of God. We walk in the wisdom of men. 
That's been a problem since man has been upon the face of the earth. We're trying to walk in our own wisdom, and when we try to walk in our own wisdom, we fail. We mess this stuff up instead of walking in God's wisdom. Our union, our identification with Christ results in our having God's wisdom. Partakers of his divine nature. And you, have to, you have to repeat this to yourself to understand what is in you, what really is in you. You can get people to believe other things about themselves. But why can't we get them to believe the most important thing that they are, that they're in Christ and who they are? The primary intellect and philosophy and wisdom of men are easily overcome through God's wisdom. Let's turn over here to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 2. We're going to walk through the Bible a little bit today. And, uh, and so you can always go back and look at this, and you can always study other scriptures that are related to, to these scriptures, uh, particularly if you have any study Bibles. But let's go over here to, and, and, and read 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 15 here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Here we go. And this is Paul speaking. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, and he's talking about the wisdom of men, declaring to you the testimony of God. Because the reality, Paul knew, um, Paul knew that there's a separate wisdom of natural things, and then there's the divine wisdom of God. And he's talking about the natural wisdom, not the divine wisdom. So he didn't come to them with flowery words of men's wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. See, this wisdom pointed out what God did, not what he did. When we, when, we, when we lean on our own wisdom, we begin to talk about ourselves and not what really God has done for us, not whether what God wants to do for everyone else. And so that's kind of what he's saying. For I determined not to know anything among you, particularly not to talk about man's wisdom to you in flowery words, but except Christ and him crucified. I was with you, he says, in weakness and fear. He says, now these were my problems. You know, when I stood before you, I was, I had, I was fearful. He said, I was fearful. I was weak in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with pervasive words of human wisdom. So he's like you and I. I mean, we can get nervous when we talk to people. We can have fears. But he had to put that to the side and turn to God's wisdom to pursue what God had called him to do, what Christ had called him to do. And my speech and my preaching were not with pervasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration, righteous proof, that's what that means, a righteous proof of the spirit of power that your faith should not be in wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, wisdom is not in men, but God. Now, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, or of men, not, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. So that wisdom will take you nowhere, of men, it'll take you nowhere. But we speak the wisdom, the divine wisdom of God. Paul, we speak the wisdom when we come and speak before you, notwithstanding my own weakness, I'm made strong in his strength. I'm made strong in his strength, but I make sure that I speak to you the wisdom of God, the divine revelation of God, his wisdom. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, for us, which none of the rulers of this age knew. How could they know it? Because they didn't have God's wisdom. Because they didn't have God's wisdom. Which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as written, eye has not seen, the ear has heard, nor have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed to them, to us, through what? Through his spirit. And we get wisdom through his spirit. 
So if we're not connected to a spirit, if we don't have a relationship with God, we cannot walk in the divine wisdom of God, and we cannot know the things of God. We can't. And this is what Paul is saying. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world. Now we have not, I'm not, not, not stopped on purpose. We have not received the Spirit of the world. That means you shouldn't be going out here acting the fool like the world. That's basically what he's saying. We shouldn't be cutting up like the world. Right? Our life is not in the world. But our life is in Christ. Our life is in Christ. So, but the Spirit is from God we, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Because if you don't know, the world doesn't know, the carnal man doesn't know the value of this treasure that God gave to us. They cannot know because they can only be spiritually discerned. And we can only walk in them by the power of the Spirit. So the carnal man, the worldly man, cannot know the things that we're talking about. They'll look at you like you're crazy, huh? because they don't understand the spiritual things of the God. That doesn't make them any less valuable or any less important, because the world will try to make you think those things are not valuable or important. That's why we have to know Christ and what he's given to us in every way, and the treasure that's in us, and root ourselves and thirst for more of his word so we can understand and stand the trouble, because the trouble's coming. It's coming. And so we are to be equipped to stand in difficult times, and, and we talked about that that. Bible study that, that, that we have to build our house. We're master builders. As Paul said, I'm a master builder. But we have to be careful what, found, what foundation, what we put on the foundation of Christ. Because we could be putting all kinds of trash on the foundation. Ultimately, it will fall apart. And so going on, he says, now we have received, verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, the Spirit who is from God, Holy Spirit, is in short, that we might know the things that have been freely given us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. The Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. But the natural man, the carnal man, the natural man, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can they he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You want to lose your spiritual discernment? You continue to run with carnal people, and you'll lose it because you won't be thinking about any spiritual things at all because the way they think is opposed to the, the spiritual things of, of God. And so in order for us to, to walk in his wisdom, we have to walk in the spirit of the Holy Ghost, because the Holy Ghost will lead us into truth. The Holy Spirit will guide us. The Holy Spirit will teach us. That's what it says. That's what Jesus said. He said, when I leave, I'm giving you another comforter. Didn't he say that? That will guide you in all truth. See, we don't see. We just know what we have. And we have to look at what we have. We have to look at the treasure. And if you, if you have to repeat to yourself every day what's in me, then that's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. Repeat to yourself, what is the treasure that's in you? And, and so we see that, that the wisdom of God and the wisdom of men, they cannot mix. You get in trouble, you're trying to mix the spiritual with the carnal. It just doesn't work. You can't have two gods. There can only be one if we're believers. If we're believers. And so we see that. And I just want to share that with you because Paul, Paul talks about this wisdom and Paul talks about this wisdom because you had the Corinthians who were being pulled in various directions. You had them following various people. As I said before, Cephas, uh, they were following or Peter. Uh, they were following uh, Paul. They were following Apollos. And, and, and again, Paul said, enough of this. We follow Christ. But God gives the increase. Yeah, we, yeah we, these men have, may have valuable skills, but it's God who gives the increase. He is the one that we point to. That is the wisdom that we need to walk in. That is the wisdom we need to practice to walk in. So men going on here after that, men can be easily going back to the points here. Men can easily be manipulated and overcome with intellectual arguments and personality. 
But we must allow the simple message of the cross and his Holy Spirit working through us to give power to our words, to give power to our life, to give power to our decisions, the decisions that we have to make. If it's a difficult decision, I hope you're going to God and asking him. I hope you're asking the Spirit, Lord, lead me, guide me in the decision I have to make. Or what, what, I have, what should I say, Lord, in this situation? We must allow the Holy Spirit to guide us, and this is what we were talking about here, to guide us into his truth through the wisdom. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts, to guide us. And we all know when the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Normally, when we do mess up somewhere along the line, the Holy Spirit, go back. The Holy Spirit has told you, ah, don't do that. Amen? I know in my case, some, if I think about it, yeah, I did get that warning, but I ignored it. Yep, I knew, I knew and so we must, we must, and we must, we must recapture that feeling of when God speaks to us. And it's different for all of us. It's different for all of us. But we must understand and recapture that feeling of when God speaks to us. Caution. This does not mean we do not prepare ourselves through study, through training, through prayer, through praise, all those things. But through the preparation, we allow ourselves to be moved by the Spirit. Through preparation, we do allow ourselves to be moved by, to read in his words, say, oh, God, that's what you meant when you said this. Because there's, you know what, and, and all of you have experienced this, and I know I've had a discussion with Stephanie about this, you know what, I can read the same scripture next year and it will show me something different. Right? That's growth. That's growth. That's God showing you various things, of, and they're various signs of God and what he shows about himself and about his words. Apart from the divine revelation, man can never through his own wisdom, he can never through his own wisdom come to the knowledge of God. Salvation requires belief in Christ, not of worldly understandings of science or philosophy. Philosophy will never get you saved. Looking for signs will never get you saved but believing in the person of Jesus Christ and receiving him will be, and confessing him and believing in your heart will be your salvation. That is the only way. And that is the only way to the Father, to accepting Jesus and his life in you, we get to the Father and have a relationship, a reconciled relationship with the Father. There's no other way. Do not let some talking head on television tell you there are many ways to heaven. There's not. There's only one way. And through Jesus Christ. But men will give you persuasive arguments. See, that's what I'm talking about. They will give you persuasive arguments that get you to believe in another way. And Jesus says there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to him. And that's who we follow. But we have to believe that. We have to believe that. Apart from the divine, let me read again. Men can never through his own wisdom come to this knowledge. Let's go over here to Luke. I better stop here because if I don't, I will have you here for another hour. <laughs> Amen. No, I would really know this point. And, and just, if you want to, if you want, no, seriously, because I really want to delve into this, this is because this is about the scribes and the Pharisees, the lawyers. The scribes were actually lawyers. They were, they were men of the law. And Jesus had some very... I would say harsh words for the scribes and the Pharisees and what they did to men and how they prevented men from coming into the wonderful salvation and what they put on men and women, rules and regulations that they didn't keep themselves. They were hypocrites. And so Jesus has some very specific words, and so it pertains to us because our lives, sometimes we think we're morally better than the scribes and Pharisees, but sometimes if, we, if we're not walking in the wisdom of God, we're just like them. We can become just like them. So I do want to take my time and really, really dissect that and go into some rather, some detail about that so we can avoid that and recognize when somebody is using the phylacteries of Jesus Christ, the phylacteries of men, to deceive us. And I think that's a good place for us to start next Sunday and we'll look at uh, uh, that about the, the lawyers. Jesus didn't have a good thing for lawyers at that point. So, mm. amen. And so we'll stop there and uh, pray.
praise God. So somebody come up. And get, get my pretty wife and uh, drag her away from uh, the little children. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. A lot of them back there, aren't they? We are growing generations back there. Hallelujah. Generations. Man, we got, we, we affecting generations beyond us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. They are getting the word. Thank you, Jesus. Usually I would go on at 1 o'clock, but I won't do that today. Oh, you're welcome, darling. Amen. I thought it was, too. Gracious. Amen. Hallelujah. Quick announcement. Besides Thanksgiving coming up, I want to thank all those who came out for our first Bible study lesson. We're master builders in the foundations of the faith. I just want to let you know, if you're interested, let me know, because the foundation is incredible. Knowing what you know and knowing that you know it and you can reference it will make all the difference in the world. Lauren had to tap into something in order to make a connection with the daughter of the mother who could have passed away. So those of you who heard that testimony this morning, you have to know what the word tells you. And without the foundation, there are going to be many opportunities where you're going to wish you knew where that scripture was, and you're not going to be able to pull it out of your phone if the technology is not available. Mm. You've got to know it for yourself. So let me know if you're interested, because we're moving forward with this in a profound way. I really believe in these days, and Kirk is bringing some cutting-edge focus. I believe when we pray in the back, Kirk, you may not see it, but the things that he's bringing to our attention through prayer, I believe, are timely. We know it's the end times. We know this. This much we know. But you want to know that you know where you're headed. Amen. And the only way you can do that is really firm your foundation. So I'm just assuming that the ones who are not coming, you got it. Thank you, Jesus. We're, we're, we give you a high five. But those of you who need to be reminded, and I need daily reminders personally, Amen. join us for the Bible study. Join us. But we need to know ahead of time who's going to be there. We have extra materials, but we're moving on to the second session on November 30th. And we didn't have a chance to put the uh, those who are interested in a group, a hangout group, so we still have to do that. So you know, some of you asked, well, what's it on? Yeah, we did, weren't able because Neil was out of town. I don't know how to do that, <clears throat> and, uh, but Neil knows how to do that. We'll get those glitches together, but there's still an opportunity. Yeah. Um, Becca, did you have anything you want to say to the youth? I want to thank, we had so many in the back. And they really did a great job today. Really a great job. Debbie said, wait a minute, it was empty for a period, now it's packed. <laughs> and I want to really thank Corey and Santana for stepping up to the plate to help out with the crafts today. Elway came back, Debbie helped, I helped. We did what we could, but thank you so much. Amen. Anything else, David? We're affecting the generation. Amen. Oh, Amen. And that generation is affecting me, and I like that. I like the influence they're putting in my heart because I'm feeling like, okay, I'm taking a back seat in the back. But I love it because I'm watching the growth of those who used to be the ones that were sitting in those chairs that we're instructing, and now they're rising up, whether it's through worship, whatever they're doing, whether it's through ministry, through preaching, or doing the communion, or whatever they're doing. I'm just so pleased to watch them grow. Amen. 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 Well, God loves you. You have a great day. Make sure you bundle up when you leave. Amen. Amen. It's a little chilly. Have a great day.